Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, open forum on the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. Uh, we are just sorting out one matter technically, and then we will get started. Um, could I? Okay. Um, <laughs> am I able to control the slides? Yeah, okay, because I don't know how I... <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to anyone who is joining us uh, remotely. Um, uh, I'm David Sullivan. I'm the Executive Director of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. We're thrilled to be here at the IGF um, holding our open forum. Uh, what we're going to do today is first, um, I am going to uh, <laughs> tell you a little bit uh, more about the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, our objectives, the progress we've made, our approach um, to really uh, articulating industry best practices for trust and safety online. Uh, and then we'll talk about what that means um, for the free and open internet. And we have a terrific panel of uh, guests and experts joining us um, from across the region, around the world, different stakeholder constituencies. Uh, and uh, we will uh, so have that panel discussion and then we'll really try to benefit from the expertise uh, of everyone here in the room uh, and save plenty of time for open discussion and Q&A. Um, so with that, um, I'm happy to get started. I just, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, here's our agenda, <laughs> as just mentioned. Um, and uh, I'll introduce our panelists uh, in a moment when we get to that piece. Um, but first, let me tell you all a little bit more um, about the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership. Um, so uh, uh, DTSP um, uh, launched uh, two and a half years ago in February 2021. Um, we're really a, a, a voluntary industry body um, that's come together to articulate uh, best practices for what we call trust and safety. Um, this is a term that is well understood uh, within the industry, within technology companies, um, where teams responsible for something called trust and safety have often been around for 15 or even 20 years. Um, but it's a term that is less well understood and maybe is often more thought of uh, within the internet governance space as platform governance, platform regulation, uh, content moderation, online safety, all of the issues around the content and conduct online uh, that we are all concerned about. Um, so our partners have come together uh, to articulate best practices um, using a risk-based approach. Uh, and I would say that there's two fundamental aspects to how our partnership works um, that we wanna highlight and start with. The first is that um, there are uh, uh, many uh, and I think even within the IGF, uh, probably at other sessions that are going on right now, uh, very important discussions about the sort of normative aspects of how should content be governed and regulated online. You know, what does international human rights law say about this? What does uh, national law and regulation say about this? Our partnership is taking a different point of departure. Um, we are uh, descriptive. <laughs> and so we say there are practitioners inside tech companies who've been working on these issues. Let's describe the work th that they do. The second fundamental piece is that um, we are not suggesting that companies offering products and services that are very different from each other, from search engines to social media to instant messaging to dating to video games to sharing economy, um, uh, the, the idea is that all of these companies should have their own um, policies, their own terms of service that are particular to their product, um, to their audience, um, but that these companies can use the same practices um, it, to address uh, the content and conduct that they do not want to see on their platforms. So we are about aligning companies around practices, um, not around specific types of content. Um, so as I said, different risks, different threats for all different types. So there really is no one size fits all approach to trust and safety. Uh, and as we know, this is a constantly evolving and changing world. Uh, the threats that people are worried about online uh, tomorrow will be different than they are today. Uh, and so we need this risk-based approach that is going to evolve over time. Here's just a quick snapshot of our current uh, partner companies. 
Uh, and as you can just see from a, that quick glance, um, we bring together companies of different sizes, um, with different business models, and very different products and services. But again, trying to align around those common approaches, uh, the common framework. Um, and so um, here is our best practices framework, um, which are all of our companies commit to. Uh, so be basically, we have five overarching commitments um, that all of the companies uh, who are partners of DTSP commit to. And they mirror the product uh, development life cycle uh, and start with product development. So this is really about safety by design uh, and sort of identifying and evaluating content and conduct related risks in product development. So as I said, this is not particular to child safety. It's not particular to disinformation, um, but it can really encompass uh, any of the, the risks that a company might be concerned about. Um, the second commitment is around governance and ado adopting the sort of uh, being transparent and, adop and adop adopting explainable rules for their product or service, um, enforcing those rules in the third commitment around enforcement, improving over time, uh, and then being transparent with the public um, about how uh, all of these processes take place. So here you can see uh, that underneath those five overarching commitments that I just mentioned, we've articulated around 35 specific best practices for trust and safety. Uh, and the idea is that companies can use whatever combination of these practices um, or perhaps identify other practices um, that are particular for their product or service um, that they can implement uh, in order to sort of align with our framework. Um, the goal is uh, not really to say that, hey, here is all of the answers to dealing with trust and safety online, but to say, here's a framework. Can you find within this what works for your company, um, for your product, your service? Um, so having best, best practices is great, um, <laughs> uh, but um, it doesn't mean anything unless there's really a uh, robust evaluation and assessment of how companies are using those practices. Um, so the first thing that our organization did after it launched in February of 2021 was to develop a methodology for assessing how companies are implementing these practices, um, which we published uh, in December uh, of uh, 2021 called the SAFE Framework. Uh, and in 2022, uh, our founding companies uh, undertook self-assessments um, of their own trust and safety practices using this approach. Uh, and uh, two things that are fundamental to this approach to assessment, which I think can be relevant to a lot of the conversations that are going on now globally about what to do about these issues about online content. The first is that the assessments are tailored based on risk. Um, so they're about looking at the size and scale of a company so that we're not asking a company like Bitly um, to do the same assessment we would expect of a, a Google or a Microsoft. Um, uh, and then also look at risk, look at the um, user volume for a product or service, or look at the um, uh, product features um, that might introduce levels of complexity or risk that would warrant taking a much more intensive and detailed look at that product or service. And then based on that, companies used this five-step uh, assessment methodology um, to look at and find out what level of maturity are their products and services. And we actually developed this maturity rating scale, um, sort of five steps from ad hoc to optimized, uh, and companies used our process to identify where they saw their own practices as less mature or more mature. Uh, and because our goal as an industry association is to develop pr best practices and show accountability. It's not to be ranking our companies against one another. So in our public report uh, about these practices, um, which is on our website, dtspartnership.org, um, we aggregated uh, and sort of uh, anonymized uh, the, d the results of these self-assessments uh, in order to show what's the range of maturity for the different practices that our companies are using for online safety. Uh, and what we found um, was here's where companies saw their practices as being more mature. Uh, and these processes, generally speaking, are things that teams within companies responsible for um, trust and safety or content policy um, can often do sort of by, them, by themselves. Um, teams that have been working on having policies and standards uh, and enforcing those standards and reporting on those standards 
that is where companies tended to find that they were more mature. Um, looking at where companies saw um, their practices as less mature and in need of improvement, um, these are the practices uh, on this slide. And here we can see it's oftentimes things that involve working with external organizations and external. So getting input from users on how to shape content policies, um, working on community self-regulation for the types of services that have that kind of community moderation component, um, or working with researchers and academics on things like access to data and other programs like that. Um, so this is a snapshot in time that's now more than a year old, um, but I do think it sort of gives a sense of where the industry uh, saw itself as doing better uh, and in, as in need of improvement and um, uh, something to build on. Um, so uh, where we are now uh, is we've shared those results uh, and we are starting to pilot how we can look at having uh, independent assessments, um, where it's not the companies assessing themselves, um, but having independent third-party assessments um, that can uh, complement uh, or work with or help provide companies with workable solutions for uh, compliance with many of the co online content regulation regimes that we're seeing developing in different places around the world, some of which we'll talk about in the panel discussion shortly. Um, so. Um, just to kind of restate, the objectives for our partnership is really first about bringing companies together to protect people online, protect their safety and protect their rights. Um, see how these best practices can be supported um, by governments as they consider their own approaches to content regulation. Um, grow our membership uh, so that it is reflective uh, of the global uh, world and all of the people uh, uh, who are using these services around the world, so looking for new members from other parts of the world, uh, and look to lay the groundwork for international standards uh, in this space. Um, there's a number of things that we've done recently that I wanted to mention briefly. We've just released over the summer um, an industry glossary of trust and safety terminology in order that our members can kind of align around the baseline definitions for the terms um, that trust and safety professionals use in their daily lives. Uh, again, that's on our website uh, and there's uh, copies I can share. Um, we have a booth in the exhibition hall where you can also access that via a QR code. Um, we're also working uh, in multi-stakeholder and public-private partnerships, including with the World Economic Forum's Global Coalition on Digital Safety, uh, to develop uh, together with civil society and regulators and international organizations um, some common approaches to things like risk assessment. Um, and we've just launched and published a, uh, a set of guiding principles and best practices for age assurance, um, showing how our partnership can zero in and develop some uh, practices on specific elements within this broader framework of trust and safety. Um, so as I said, next steps is really looking at those, pi trying to pilot an approach to third party assessment, continuing to consult broadly with stakeholders uh, and support our companies with their efforts towards having really um, meaningful uh, and transparent compliance with regulations uh, in a way that ultimately makes people safer online. So with that, um, I think we can move on to the panel discussion here. Uh, and I am thrilled to welcome our, our, our panelists. So um, here in the room, uh, we have uh, Nobu from the Ministry of Communications of Japan. Uh, we have uh, Kimi from Open Net Korea, civil society organization from Korea. Uh, we have Angela, who is the head of um, Trust and Safety Research and Partnerships at Google and a DTSP board member. and. Farzana, do we have our remote speakers as well? Yes. Yeah, so online uh, we have um, uh, 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 Brent Carey uh, from uh, NetSafe and we have uh, Rashika from the uh, Online Safety Commission of Fiji. Um, and so um, really what we wanted to uh, do with this open forum was to, you know, sort of uh, leverage the expertise of the global internet governance community to talk about what does this industry kind of effort on trust and safety mean for a free and open internet? And can you know, this approach of industry best practices and standards um, be leveraged to prevent things like internet fragmentation uh, and support the, the goals that we ultimately want of an internet that facilitates and promotes people's rights 
uh, and while also keeping them safe. So I'm gonna start here uh, with you, Nobu, thank you. Uh, the Japanese government has been generously uh, uh, hosting us here <laughs> in Kyoto, it's been wonderful. Um, so you have really uh, an extensive career in technology policy um, here in Japan, as well as working at the OECD. Uh, and um, I wanted to ask you, what role do you see in terms of industry practices um, when it comes to the development of Japan's approach uh, to regulating online content? Um, and um, how do you see this um, potentially supporting or, or not um, the goal that I know Japan very much shares of an open and interoperable internet? Uh, hello, everybody. Then my name is Nobu Nishigara from the Japanese government, and thanks for the kind introduction. <laughs> and uh, you know, the w y you guys, everybody, is welcome to to come here. Then, then let me say, uh, we also thank you, everybody, for your participation and the contribution, which made this event great. So this is now, uh, of course, we did a lot of the job and preparation to host you, but on the other hand, it is not all. So <laughs> remember that everybody makes this happen. So, and having said that, then uh, thanks for the question. Then, then just uh, you know, the before answering the directly to the question, let me make it clear that uh, one point that the Japanese government is not engaged in uh, the direct regulation over the online content. I mean, except for the broadcasting. You know, we have some regulation, so i do that the other countries, and we have some regulation on the broadcast content, but on the other hand, we don't have the direct regulation on the online content yet. But on the other hand, having said that, again, then, then of course we do respect the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, etc. but on the other hand, uh, there's the, the secondly, though I have to say that, that there are several outstanding content issues <laughs> regarding the online uh, delivery or uh, you know, circulation, etc. So to name a few, then, then the CSAM, the spam, or maybe it's, it's outstanding in Japan, or cyberbearing, or online slandering, or the, for Maybe I would say include the, the, the piracy, the content, the de deliberation. I mean, delivery, the, the pirated contents in the manga. Like. I mean, regarding the manga piracy issue in Japan, it's heavy. Uh, please find your time to visit the IJF village, I mean, the exhibition the downstairs, to stop at the booth and then presenting how we con combat without the direct regulation of the over the pirate contents, but uh, we still fight. And uh, there are some introductions that there, then you can get some souvenir as well. <laughs> That's a, a little advertisement because the personally I organized the half part of the, the exhibitions. <laughs> <laughs> then like uh, the s the for those issues, what we do is like uh, we have introduced several measures for the each or the for the mitigation. For example, like uh, we have the particular regulation to solve a uh, particular problem, like uh, for spam. Like uh, we have the some particular regulation against the spam. And we have some particular regulation to protect the, the children from the online harms, uh, particularly for the CSAM. And of course, we do have some voluntary works. Uh, it's a voluntary, though, but uh, to to enable the filtering installation, soft, I mean software in installation, uh, some help with the telephone carriers in the smartphone, etc. Uh, and uh, the same for the same purpose to 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 you know keep the children from the online harms. And uh, maybe we have some other regulation. I mean, this could be some common practice within the particularly in, the, I would say, like-minded countries, but uh, limit the liabilities of the internet service providers uh, to enable their prompt action to avoid uh, the online harms to the people. Uh, so, like uh, these are the you know uh, particularly applies to internet, but uh, the technology is so fast, right? It's 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 uh, unique to the internet, I would say. And then we have to review and update almost every year. Everything. So, so better than losing my job, it's okay to be busy, but uh, still, the um, internet keep, keep us very busy, and uh, this is where the best practice role come in. You know? So the, we face several dilemma, particularly the between the public safety versus human rights, right? And uh, the public safety is our biggest concern as a whole government. So or maybe the individual personal safety, particularly who suffered from the online harm, versus the, the, the other people's human rights, which is gonna be the, where to be the balance, you know? 
so you know, it's a bunch of dilemma that we face when we have to think about these things. But 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 you know that it, that this actually the personally though uh, that I'm having the great expectation of the further development of this work at the DPP because like uh, once information of the best practice at least I mean from the company side, this is gonna help us a lot. You know, I mean. We do usually, like uh, for example, maybe like uh, the, the current European legislation, new legislation, like a Digital Service Mark Act, DSA. That's going to be the one reference point when we think about the new regulation. I mean, compared to what we have, I mean, it's a, I mean different style, but maybe like uh, the what we we can do as a government is just very similar. But uh, maybe one difference is like uh, we don't have, or maybe we have not reached to the level of the core regulation in this area. Like a company makes a commitment to the government, right? Then, then like a government is gonna evaluate the commitment later. And we have that kind of system uh, toward the, the uh, in the regulation on the online platform, but it's about the competition side. Like a compare, I mean, s very similar to the mechanism to the DMAs, and actually the Japan predated the EU, so maybe EU's got a better system, I would say, but uh, we still have some co-regulation. It's a first example, a uh, good first example of the co-regulation in uh, Japanese society or Japanese market, I would say. So, so the co-regulation, I mean, the, even though we don't really have to co do the co-regulation because uh, if we the, the information from the company, uh, what they are doing as a good practices at least, and then it's gonna be available, then, then we can learn from them. Then, then maybe we can talk to the, the some problem, <laughs> problem having companies that, hey, come on, then fix the report, you know? <laughs> I mean, you don't really have to, but you have to look at it. And then you can think about uh, fixing a little bit about your conduct, you know? I mean, otherwise, you know, if it gets mandatory, then it's gonna be huge, heavy work for the government and uh, maybe some bad reputation to the, <laughs> the company as well. So it's kind of lose and lose situation in which we don't want to have in many cases. So so that that that's the kind of expectation that already have, then then, just, you know, I, I just talked about some of the example of the, the online content issue in Japan, but, uh, you know, to toward the open and the interoperable internet, then it, it is not only the content issue, but, you know, there are many, many issues in internet. I mean, of course, like, uh, the, as a government person, I, I understand that uh, some frustration comes in from the tech company, you know, the come on, get, don't get into the market, you know, government should stay away from it. Like <laughs> we understand to some extent, but on the other hand, you know, as I said, that pu public safety concerns us, right? So there, there could be some, well, I mean, it, it's gonna be easier if we could draw the line, but the, the line is not a straight single one. So, you know, we have to keep talking, talking those kind of things. So uh, from that perspective, maybe, uh, you know, these best practice as well and that helps. And uh, the, let me finish by the one more the introduction and then I'm not sure if you are aware of, but uh, our Prime Minister Kishida came to this event in the day one and uh, he made some speeches and uh, uh, you know, the highlight maybe for this open forum would be that, uh, that he committed and of course we have to follow it once he commits, <laughs> right? Uh, he committed it to the uh, the, the open and free internet to maintain. I mean, there are background, some evidences like uh, Japan is one of the first country to, to, to express our support to the future declaration on the internet. Or like uh, the, as a G7 chair this year, like uh, we led the discussion about, uh, it's a kind of rare case that the G7 ministers get together. I mean, the, we, we have the G7 minister meeting every year, but on the other hand, we don't talk about internet governance very much, but on the other hand, uh, if you can have, a, you have the time to look at the, the ministerial declaration in uh, ta from Takasaki, it's on April 30 uh, this year. But we very much having the fix on internet governance and uh, you know that G7 get together, uh, join force to support this IG event or like, a, you know, uh, making the, some collaboration effort to, to 
to task force to 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 cope with the, like uh, you know UN GDP initiative those kind of things to, to maintain the open free internet so so you know that these things I mean every we, we we have to maintain our good environment right I mean the government has to <laughs> the, the thing that the government has to do it we do it but uh, you know the the government cannot solve many problems by only by ourselves and we need your help to push these things forward so Thank you very much. Maybe I should stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nobu. I think that was great. I already starting to hear some themes that I think other speakers will come back to uh, in terms of the value of the conversation between uh, companies and regulators and other stakeholders, um, the importance of the leadership of states like Japan, especially taking this to the G7, um, raising internet governance there. Um, but of course, there are many states around the world, and this segues nicely uh, to turn to our first uh, online speaker, uh, Rishika Chandra um, from Fiji's Online Safety Commission. Um, so uh, I think what we know is that um, while many states, and uh, Fiji I commend for taking the lead as a small island state working on safety of people online, um, but not all states have the same level of resources uh, and the same heft um, that either the European Union that you mentioned with the Digital Services Act um, or Japan might have. Um, but nonetheless, uh, these states are working together and thinking about ways um, in uh, to pool resources and work together to coordinate in terms of online safety. And there I was particularly hoping that um, Rashika can tell us about uh, the work that Fiji is doing um, as well through the Global Online Safety Regulators Network um, in this space. Um, so. Uh, Rashika, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, greetings to you all. My name is Rashika, and I'm the Projects Officer for the Online Safety Commission, Fiji. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the management for making Fiji part of the 18th IGF. Thank you very much. Um, before diving into the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, I would like to first um, give a bit of um, background a, or about online safety as to what we do. Uh, so Fiji is one of the first countries to recognize the importance of online safety and take concrete steps towards ensuring a secure digital environment for its citizens. In 2018, Fiji enacted the Online Safety Act, which paved the way for the establishment of the Online Safety Commission in 2019. Since its inception, the OSC has been dedicated to promoting online safety through various initiatives. One of the primary objectives of the OSC is to raise awareness about online safety among individuals and communities. To achieve this, the Commission organizes awareness and education programs that aims to educate people about potential risks and provide them with tools to protect them, themselves online. So we partner locally for example, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Fiji Police Force in 2020. They help us to um, uh, they help us to enforce and prosecute matters that breaches the Online Safety Act. Additionally, we work with other uh, relevant ministries locally, um, NGOs as well as non-governmental agencies to promote online safety and digital literacy. Going on to the international engagements, uh, firstly, I would like to highlight our partnership with eSafety Commissioner. Australia. The partnership had been engaged, uh, had been ex exchanged in 2021. Under this arrangement, the organization works together to support online safety in Fiji and Australia through sharing best practice, raising awareness of online safety trends and emerging issues, develop national online safety strategies, strengthening online safety response capabilities, and working together to achieve mutually beneficial online safety outcomes. Moving on to um, social media platforms, um, we partner with uh, Meta and TikTok because in Fiji, there's a lot of uh, users of Instagram, Facebook, vastly Instagram, and Facebook, and TikTok. So um, we took this initiative to um, extend uh, our partnership with uh, Meta and TikTok. We work with them closely. Um, one of the primary ways in which we collaborate with these tech companies is through their con con 
content reporting systems. These systems allow users to report any content that they find offensive or harmful. The commission has, has, has been actively using these reporting mechanisms to moderate and take down contents that cause or intends to cause harm to an individual. Furthermore, I, the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, it was formed back in 2022. It, it's, it was recently formed. So the Online Safety Commission, eSafety Australia and Ofcom are the movers of the network. Um, the purpose of the network is to bring together independent online safety regulators to cooperate across jurisdictions sharing relevant information, best practice, experience, and expertise, and support harmonized or coordinated approaches to online safety issues. Since its formation, the network has immensely expanded with members from Fiji, UK, Australia, Ireland, um, Africa, and Korea. The discussion and debates from these networks have played a pivotal role in helping the commission gain valuable insights into debates into, into how different countries tackle online abuse and incorporate these safety policies into their laws and how the and the, the the knowledge sharing platform has provided an opportunity for countries to learn from each other's experiences successes and challenges pg being a small pacific country uh, is making significant strides towards embracing the tech world However, it can benefit immensely from observing and adopting best practices employed by other nations. By doing so, Fiji can ensure that its citizens are protected against online abuse while fostering a safe digital environment. So that was about the Global Online Safety Regulators Network. Um, we have recently actually welcomed uh, Africa and Korea to our network. So basically, we discuss um, topics around age verification, age assurance. These are some hot topics that we are currently on. Um, human rights, paper, freedom of speech. So these are the these are the regulations we usually talk about. There's like a working level um, working level uh, meetings and a senior level meeting. Um, I represent the working level, and Ms. Tajeshwari Devi, who's the commission acting commissioner for the online safety commission, represents on the senior level. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Rashika. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting to see how, um, yeah, regulators are also uh, sort of thinking about how to come together and where we can find points of interoperability, uh, I think, between what's happening in the governmental space and what's happening in uh, the industry space uh, where our partnership works. So we're gonna ping pong across uh, the Pacific a little bit and we'll now turn to uh, Kimmy from uh, Open Net Korea, a civil society organization that's really been leading uh, as a watchdog for freedom of expression uh, in Korea. And th so the mention of Korea having joined the Regulators Network is, is um, uh, timely, uh, but I think we wanted to talk about what, uh, what regulation looks like in Korea and whether you see some opportunities or challenges um, for the sort of practice-based approach of systems and processes um, to online safety that we're uh, promoting uh, when it comes to protecting human rights, um, particularly in the Korean context. First, thank you for having me. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, Kishida <laughs> declared <laughs> open <laughs> openness commitment because you know, our president did <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, so, but the current situation related to platform companies in South Korea is not good. Actually, it is very bad. The UN government has been trying to control platforms and censor the user-made user -made content under the name of to make a healthy society and foster internet ecosystem. In these circumstances, civil society organizations in South Korea request each platform to disclose the number of government requests for user information and take down contents. I mean, transparency. South Korea has several interesting experiences with transparency. Until 2011, the two big platforms, you know, Naver and Kakao, disclosed the number of govern government requests to for communications data. They published the result on their parents' report. This made a huge impact on public opinion and legitimized the platform refusing government requests. I'm focusing on transparency and enforcement, enforcement when I review this report. Actually, 
DTSP is an honorable multi-phase initiative by digital companies to enhance the tra uh, trust and safety of their pr products. Uh, but I also how hard it is to assess different platform using standardized indexes. Yeah, because each platform is different from each other. Size, earnings, business models, target consumers, and so on. If we can somehow apply all these factors, the result might be different. Here are my comments for improvement as a civil society organization's researcher. So it could be, com it could not be comprehensive. Yeah. First, I have five comments. <laughs> yeah. First, <laughs> trust and safety does not take into account the human rights harms when contents are taken down or otherwise censored. Trust and safety is defined in terms of content and conduct related risk, which is in turn defined as illegal, dangerous, or otherwise harmful content or behavior. The way it is defined, only the contents, not their takedowns, are deemed as causing risks. These are sufficiently protect one important human right, freedom of expression. If uh, one can be harmed directly by another's contents, that is because it causes mental distress or on the subject or audience. However, censorship can also be dangerous if disserting voices are removed. For instance, in a society charged with religious hatred, majority leaders or the government's in disinformation can trigger violence on the majority minority, and censoring minorities' leaders will further weaken them. This is especially important because digital authoritarianism is on the rise. The governments are becoming more and more the source of harmful disinformation and harmful censorship. Second, DTSP safe framework is so well thought out that it seems adaptable to any country, any industry, not just the digital industry. I can clear, clearly see the same iteration of development, governance, enforcement, improvement, and transparency being very important to the trust and safety of the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. <laughs> but I am then worried whether the framework sufficiently focuses on the unique aspect of the digital industry, such as freedom of expression or privacy. Digital industries have formed the liberating and equalizing core of human civilization. Search engines and platforms have provided powerless individuals with the same power of information and mass communication formally available only to big companies, government, or legal media. Can we define trust and safety in ways that protect the unique civilization significance of the internet or will DTSP become the numerous consumer pr product safety initiatives? I think that the success of DTSP li lies in whether we can answer these questions correctly. Third, fortunately, one way to strengthen the connection to the unique significance of the digital industry is already reflected in some of the 35 best practices. That is collaboration of digital rights organizations. Now technology has been welcomed as much as internet. It was met by new wave of numerous organizations dedicating to protection of the internet. These organizations and companies have common goals only if the companies allow, deviating a little <laughs> from their profit motives. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> DTSPs <laughs> ask companies to work with organizations in the process of product development, product enforcement, product improvement. However, you need the same element in transparency as well, I think, yeah. Actually, without transparency, communication during PD, PE, and PI may not be meaningful. Yeah, li uh, limited transparency with recognized human rights organization under appropriate non-disclosure agreement agreements can be very helpful in adding context and nuances to content moderation while not risking abuse by bad actors. Twitter's, yeah, I'm so sorry, it's now become X. <laughs> Twitter's Trust and Safety Council did this relatively well. 
yeah, sharing much more information about new products, enforcement, etc., with the civil society. This will answer the other question in DTSP's posed about the difficulty of maintaining transparency while not revealing information that can be used by bad actors for abusing purposes. Limited transparency will civil society group must be exploded more, explored more. Fourth, the safe framework with uh, 35 best practices, 45 questions is too abstract and procedure. Instead of defining what content should be taken down, the safe, uh, safe framework asks the following questions. How are the content reviews uh, prioritized? And what factors are taken into consideration? What types of tools or systems are used to review content or manage the review process? process? What the types of process or mechanisms are in place to proactively delete the potentially violating content or conduct? Asking these questions is not a problem in itself, but it is hard to evaluate the safe framework based on these open-ended questions because we don't know how content reviews are possibly prioritized and what possible tools systems are in place. I think the question should be phrased in yes or no format and should be reflected the digital industry's unique aspects. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just one more question. Yeah, fifth, DTSP asks the following questions. DTSP is considering whether some commitment or best practices should be given greater consideration than others when conducting assessments. I think that product uh, enforcement and product transparency are the more important because that is where the rubber meets the tires. That is where the products are in direct touch with the users. What is lacking in development, improvement, government can be compensated by rigorous enforcement and transparency. I should be close. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kimmy. That is uh, incredibly valuable feedback uh, on some of the real, like, detailed aspects of our framework, uh, and also a helpful reminder of kind of the wider human rights context uh, and the importance of, uh, of that, particularly, I think, in the world of, of trust and safety, uh, there's often a kind of, we need to take more things down, and we need to think about the consequences of when we take things down as well uh, for the rights of, of all. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm gonna turn to our other uh, remote panelist, uh, Brent Carey from NetSafe New Zealand. Um, Brent, uh, and wanna make sure we save plenty of time for Q&A, so I'll ask folks to be brief. But um, Brent, it would be great to hear from you uh, how uh, uh, NetSafe New Zealand is working uh, at the local context uh, and how you are sort of bridging this, this kind of local context uh, to sort of global company uh, tension um, that others have already spoken to. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Japan again for host nation. I was last in Kobe at uh, the ICANN and I wish I could be with you in person. Uh, obviously, New Zealand has a commitment to online safety, and in New Zealand, we passed the Harmful Digital Communications Act back in 2016. And importantly, uh, that act actually uh, has a number of principles because some of what people have talked about is uh, how fast-paced technology is and so in the Harmful Digital Communications Act in New Zealand, we have a principles-based approach to dealing with online harm. And those principles cover topics like incitement to commit suicide, uh, breach of confidentiality, um, harassment, and all sorts of other online issues. And in New Zealand, that scheme has both a criminal and a civil side. And importantly, NetSafe has been approved by the government as an NGO agency to deal with the civil side of tackling online harm. And more than 25,000 New Zealanders call on NetSafe every year uh, to assist them to uh, mediate and resolve disputes between victims, perpetrators, and also platforms. And so more than 7,000 people each year go through our mediation process. And that's something that is quite unique globally to have an ADR scheme, which is looking to resolve issues between perpetrators and victims and platforms. And importantly too, that's our local approach. 
And in our act, it is a requirement for us to work globally and work with platforms to try and address issues. And we're really heartened to by this initiative to look at a risk-based approach um, because uh, a lot of what we're doing is to look at novel approaches for tackling emerging harms. And I just want to give one example of that novel approach because I want to really get into the conversation. Uh, NetSafe took the lead to convene the platforms two years ago to think about a voluntary approach to looking at some of the more emerging and edge case harms. Those harms are like hate speech, disinformation and misinformation. And for more than two years, NetSafe convened a forum, consulted with different stakeholder groups, and eventually in July 2022, we launched the Aotearoa Online Safety Code, which is a voluntary code uh, with five platform signatories, uh, TikTok, Meta, Amazon, Twitch, Twitter, or X, as we, as we know it now. Um, and um, those platforms have agreed to look at um, some uh, sort of risk-based approaches to what they're doing in relation to those emerging areas. And importantly for New Zealand, if you go to thecode.org.nz, for the first time we've had localised data that has been provided as a result of this voluntary initiative. And just in closing, this is an emerging landscape, the online safety regime, and we've talked about the European approach. It could also be a US approach or geopolitical approach. And here in New Zealand, we're not immune to that, and we have a discussion paper called the Safer Online Services and Media Platforms Bill. I think we're sitting back to look at how the world is uh, thinking about regulating this space. And uh, that's also in play to look at what um, content regulation should look like. Importantly, in that discussion paper, it says what is already illegal and what is already harmful or objectionable won't be looked at, it'll be looking at other regulatory gaps. And um, importantly too, in New Zealand, we wanna participate in forums like this. And um, New Zealand, uh, NetSafe too is, a, um, is an observer of the regulators forum, um, along with <laughs> members that are on this panel, Fiji and Korea, and we uh, were pleased to be able to join that forum again this year too. Um, and so we're like trying to learn from best practice as well um, and also share our knowledge with the world. So thank you for the opportunity to just give that brief introduction. Thank you, uh, Brent. Really grateful to have your contributions and sorry that you and, and Rashika are not able to be with us in person. So um, I now want to turn to Angela uh, from Google, uh, who wears both a, a DTSP hat and a Google hat, but to uh, really both... Um, Perhaps, you know, tell us what may have resonated or not with some of the comments we've already heard from the other speakers and also help set the stage for a conversation with uh, the other participants here in the room. Um. Uh, happy to. And I'd like to, like my colleagues here, thank Japan for hosting us here in Kyoto and for hosting the IGF. Um, I'm really encouraged when I hear the conversation about a free, open, and interoperable internet. That is very much so what I would say not just Google and the DTSP members are looking for, but I would say many of the companies around the globe, whether it is Naver here or whether we're talking about different companies, we are wanting to operate as much as possible with a global market. And so um, may, maybe just briefly about me, I've spent about 25 years in technology risk. And so was in the world of cybersecurity for about 15 or 20 years before coming over to trust and safety. And what I wanna reflect on here is that many of the challenges that I heard highlighted and many of the solutions I heard highlighted by the panelists here are similar to what I feel like was going on in the cybersecurity conversation 15 years ago. At that point in time and where we are now, both governments, civil society and companies have realized that we need to work together to address online harms. And what I really see is governments working to figure out kind of how to do that. 
right? Oftentimes they may have existing harm-based frameworks in specific areas. Yet at the same time, they're realizing that technology is moving so quickly that, that you might not always have, if you have harm-specific focus, that you have new harms that are coming up and changing over time. And so how to deal with that changing of the technology landscape and the changing of the actual harms landscape is very similar. One of the other things I'll note is regardless of the approach, governments are going to reflect the cultural values and norms that are in their environment. So from a company point of view, we can recognize that there are going to be regulatory-based approaches. There are going to be transparency-based approaches. But I think what we are really looking for, and one of the reasons I was so happy to join DTSP and the colleagues here, is really these risk-based approaches that think about how do we approach this environment where there are trade-offs Right? We are trying to, at all of the representatives from governments up here are trying to ensure a safe online environment. Yet at the same time, I think as Kimmy really noted, there are trade-offs that happen. And so one of the things I just want to highlight, and then I'll open it up to discussion, is really the importance of these kinds of conversations. Inside of DTSP, companies need to talk to each other because we are actually learning and improving practice by doing that. We're learning from each other. I'm so encouraged where I hear about the Global Online Safety Regulators Forum because y'all need to do that too, <laughs> right? And then we also need to have that conversation with civil society. And so I think it's really important. It's not just a multi-stakeholder conversation, but also bilaterals between different types of entities such that we can collaborate and really draw forward practice overall. Um, I think I will just pause there so that we can actually open up to conversation, but a few comments just reflecting some of what I heard across the panel. Thanks, Angela. Um, so I think with that, we have the, um, you know, a less than optimal situation of the mic in the, in the center of the room, um, but we really wanted to take this point to um, open it up uh, for questions and discussion and really have as much of a roundtable conversation as we can have it in a room that lacks a roundtable. Um, uh, so, um, uh, questions? Nick? Hey, thank you for the overview and Look, I'm, I'm super happy that you all have this great space to talk to each other. Um, but I guess at IGF, I have to ask the question, what room is there for civil society? And I was wondering whether I could invite you all to reflect a little bit on these five points uh, about particularly where you might go in the future with the partnership, how you might respond to some of these concerns and some of the demands, I guess, for civil society to be more engaged and to learn more, just like you all are learning more. Um, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll go first on that one, and then welcome if uh, Angela wants to come in. We also, you know, we've heard from civil, yeah, I think that Kimmy has made some really great points from a civil society perspective, uh, and welcome comments from, from others as well. Um, I think part of the genesis of the partnership was the need that actually first step, um, we need companies to talk to each other uh, and sort of uh, come together and think. Th and so there's been a certain amount of kind of the, that preliminary phase, I would say, and also recognizing that there is value in saying that sometime that multi-stakeholder conversations are essential, whether it's here at the IGF um, or in other fora. Um, but there is also value in sort of constituency specific initiatives. Um, so we have been deliberately not multi-stakeholder while seeking to consult widely with stakeholders. And so um, many of the points that, that Kimmy made were from a public consultation we did when we released the SAFE framework. Um, we did a public consultation when uh, we, uh, uh, around the trust and safety glossary that we issued earlier this year. Uh, and we've actually authored an article for the Journal of Online Trust and Safety at Stanford about why and how we wrote that article. Uh, Farzana, myself, and, and Alex Fierce wrote that, uh, in which we responded to, I think, some of the um, you know, points raised by folks who contributed to that 
uh, consultation from academics uh, in Argentina at CELE or at CIPIC in Canada, as well as um, folks from Ofcom and eSafety who contributed their thoughts. And so I would point to that as kind of like how we are thinking about the process. Um, I think ultimately, um, you know, for us, it's important that we keep this industry perspective, but have that be a contribution and part of the discussion. Um, with all the other stakeholders, and that's why we're we're here, and it's why we're at, you know, the World Economic Forum, uh, working with that coalition, and and in other places. But um, it might be useful to hear. Um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but also to hear from from Kimmy and from. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe a couple things I'll I'll add just to David's perspective, because again, we do think it is really really important to make sure that the companies are exchanging best practices, and I think this is something that I've seen as kind of. Um, raising the tide for all the boats. And in particular, right, um, you have some big companies in the group, but you also have medium and smaller companies. And I'm hearing more and more about the importance of these kind of practices for global proliferation. But I think DTSP has, and then I'll speak to a company perspective, in the advance of the Digital Services Act being finalized, they actually did have one conversation partnered with the Global Network Initiative to bring in civil society to, to work to kind of gain some perspective. But let me just be clear, this is a maturing area for these companies. You know, if you looked at the maturity model, I feel like David actually had, like it is a maturing area. And so we're working to figure this out as well. I also think it's interesting that there is this kind of regulatory role and I feel like some civil society is like, hold on, how are we supposed to be fulfilling this role? So when I think about it, uh, from a Google perspective, we have been bringing in folks to, for example, our, um, our location in Dublin to, on specific topics around, for example, child safety and partnering with existing institutions that have great reach into the civil society community. But we're also thinking about other methods that haven't been done before, because it's not like everybody can go to one particular location, afford to fly there, and then have a conversation. We're thinking a lot more about how to use things like request for information in online forums to really catalyze this conversation. And one other thing that I'll just say is we're also trying to do a little bit of exchanging ideas among different communities of civil society. Because there are, so I manage a, a program of um, the priority flagging on a global basis. And one of the things I've noted is we have a lot of different folks who are in these civil society and academia who are in these programs, but they haven't yet talked with each other. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is go, hey, there's actually practices that you could exchange among these different harms areas that would be really useful to helping mitigate these harms. And so we're really also thinking not about how to just get the insights to the companies, but also how to catalyze that community to talk with each other. And I would welcome any of your thoughts after the event as well. And uh, let's just make sure if, if uh, Brent or uh, Rashika wanna come in that we, we keep the, and, and if there's any questions or, uh, uh, if online participants want to make any comments. Um, but uh, other questions or comments from folks in the room? <laughs> and uh, it would be great if you could just introduce yourself. I was about to. <laughs> Not my first rodeo. I'm Sharon Polsky from the Privacy and Access Council of Canada. Um, You've been at it for 25 plus years. I got you beat by a decade plus. So I've seen a lot of things in government, in private industry, across Canada, and lots of beyond as well. You say this is an industry association, a voluntary industry association. I've seen the voluntary industry associations in automotive, in advertising, in digital identity, in a, a range of others where participation, like yours, is voluntary. Frameworks are published with great PR and fanfare, lots of money, lots of people, lots of presence, and it sounds great, and one after the other, they fall by the wayside. Companies say, it's a really good idea, gung-ho on it, but w excuse us, we're not going to participate. 
It's a lot of talk and no action. Why should anybody have any trust that this is going to be any different? It's a very good question. Um, <laughs> what I would say is that um, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we are adding our uh, members to our organization. Just this year, we've added uh, TikTok and Twitch. Uh, so we're talking about the key players uh, and more to come. Uh, and ultimately, you know, all of this is only as good as it is implemented. Um, but I think what is critical is that um, this is a space that is no longer uh, just a place where companies are doing their own thing uh, and self-regulating uh, just amongst themselves. We now have this emerging regulatory regime, uh, and uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to think about how do we, within that context, try to make it meaningful. Um, so I think that's part of what we're doing right now is thinking about how does this sort of set of industry practices relate to the requirements that companies have uh, under emerging uh, regulatory regimes uh, in Australia, in Singapore, uh, in the European Union, in the UK, and in other places, and how do we make sure that those regimes actually serve their intended purposes and actually keep people safer online um, while also protecting uh, and respecting people's rights. Um, I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists would want to um, come in on that or, or add other thoughts? Yeah, actually, you criticize the self-regulation. <laughs> but actually, in South Korea, as a civil society researcher, organization activist, uh, actually, um, actually, sometimes of that criticized because we are usually, you know, claiming the uh, self-regulation, not the, uh, you know, governmental regulation. But I need this self-regulation. Uh, Self-regulation is better than you know governmental regulation because you know governmental regulation has a lot of side effects. So yeah, that's why we are criticized by South Korea. Yeah, uh, South Korean society. But and you know, I yeah, I agree with you that uh, the way of we are talking, yeah, gathering and the civil society organization and yeah, activists and the companies are. The companies and com the companies and yeah, a lot of people are gathering. The way of gathering is not changing a lot. Yeah, but I think it, that is fundamental. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it cannot be changed. And but we, I think the transparency is also important either in this point because you know um, each civil society has another actually. Uh, civil society organizations are not same. They always have different interests and different goals and different missions. And so I think uh, yeah, more and more and the best you can gather, how the, the many numbers of civil society, uh, you try to talking, you try to talk with a lot of civil society organizations. And if you make the research or third, third party assessment and put them in put them the result transparently. <laughs> yeah, how many civil society was answered and how many civil society organizations are participated in that? Yeah, the kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And I think Brent uh, wanted to come in as well on this. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a great question. Uh, I also think it um, we're all part of an ecosystem. And so I just think that's really important because the whole ecosystem has checks and balances and holds people to account as well. And I think in the safety space, um, it's also which part of the infrastructure or the internet are we asking for the interventions to happen? And because of the, the different, um, is it content-based, is it technical? And so I think all of that has, has a role to play and if the system is working well, um, it's creating the spaces and places to have those different parts of the infrastructure coming together to have those conversations. And so I do um, think it's important if it's industry led that there are those spaces and places to have those different voices. Thanks, Brent. Um, other questions? I do have a question. Uh, plus some comments as well. 
as um, a consumer of the internet. My name is Jenna Fung. I am a casual policy of servers based in Toronto, Canada. I'm originally from Hong Kong. So earlier we touched on a little bit about regulations. Um, because of my background, I'm kind of like, have a mixed feeling about having government-driven regulation le legislation as well. But I also questioned about having industry to lead and regulate all this public, uh, privately owned public space. At the end of the day, it's uh, a business. There are things that um, interest a company or organization. Um, is there a way to make sure it's like consumer rights are involved in the process? So it's reflect into all those policy. Uh, just naming one examples. Recently, uh, in, in Canada, with this Bill C-11 online, online News Act, they require tech company like Google and Meta to pay news outlet for posting or linking the content. And Meta responds in Austria, uh, I mean August is to, they claim that they're, they are to comply with the law, so they are removing news from their social media platform, including Facebook and Instagram. I moved the country to buy me some freedom to see news uh, of whatever perspective and end up I can't even use social media to see both domestic and international news. So no, so I kind of want to bring this up and see how everyone's feel about that, especially when we are in a digi digital space where uh, it's predominantly uh, lead and uh, governed or regulated by big tech. So I just want to throw that out and then see how everyone's thinking about this. Thank you. So does anybody want to respond to that particular? I will say, I think, one, thank you for the, the question and the comment. Uh, it's an important issue. I think luckily for us, there are numerous representatives from both Meta and the Canadian government uh, at the IGF, and there may be other, for, uh, other sessions where there's folks who are better, in, uh, better positioned uh, to respond to that particular issue, which is a contentious one. Um, but I do think you know, that the recognition that um, you know, notwithstanding the challenges of how um, governments of different types of governments uh, ha have been using regulation, whether um, uh, to accomplish you know, political repression um, or with the unintended consequences for people's ability to exercise their rights um, is uh, you know, an important thing to bring up. The, the digital authoritarianism that was mentioned is real and spreading and, and a challenge that we all have to grapple with. At the same time, um, there's also a recognition that you know, companies uh, doing things on their own is not, uh, not sufficient. Um, and I do think that that's one of the reasons why we're looking at both how do we have a independent third party review of what companies are doing so that companies are not checking their own homework um, while also um, figuring out how uh, not only our industry efforts, but I think also the perspectives of civil society organizations and other experts uh, and users can inform the development of the kinds of international standards that we need uh, in order to support a more mature uh, ecosystem that is both protective of, of consumers' rights and users' rights, um, while also uh, you know uh, respecting freedoms as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be long and the time is coming, right? So, but uh, I mean, I noticed the, 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 the issue about the Canada and then the maybe should be uh, sending some co condolences to the, the, those who suffered from the volcano, those kind of things. But uh, just uh, one comment, uh, it's a Japanese proverb, old saying that uh, the, the most expensive thing is provided by free. It's, it has many, many meanings, and um, particularly I have some MBA background, so particularly it's when you know the company's conduct linked to the stock market or short-sided, long-sided, those kind of things, then the many things come together. Then in me, like, um, I can explain most of the behaviors 
from the like uh, management, the business schools kind of theories. It's a, it's not new ones. It's a traditional strategy type of things. Like if you got a short sighted for the stock market, stock price, those kind of things. And uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say too too deep, but uh, you know, Meta has a history, right? So or like uh, you know, you you are paying some something somewhere. Otherwise, getting free for something, right? So then you you shouldn't expect too much about that somebody is giving you for free. <laughs> so <laughs> it's more like a literacy thing. Then then you know it's our common question to solve that the you know like we started rapidly depending too much on uh, like uh, SNS or the kind of the online media to get our information. But you have to be careful about you know they are not the, you know that. They are not having the journalist background for that. I mean, we are not sure. You know, it depends on the country how 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 much you can trust about the journalism in your country. But still, it's a there is a difference. You know, so uh, I stop here. <laughs> I was just going to say very briefly, thank you for highlighting this. And I think while I don't know the specifics, I've heard about it largely, I think you're highlighting again the challenge of trade-offs, right? Um, and that oftentimes there are unintended actions. I think the, the one thing that I want to challenge is the idea that regulation or transparency is right. I actually think that when we think about the risk-based approach and making sure that you have the right set of stakeholders involved in the conversation, that is the kind of approach that ends up being effective. It can be done with regulation, it can be done through transparency, but ultimately getting to that risk-based conversation with the right set of stakeholders is I think what really does help drive a difference. And I've seen it in, uh, just to, to comment to the, the, the world of 25 years of history, um, while a long time ago we were talking just about vulnerability management, that has improved, right? A long time ago we were talking about what is risk-based approach to cybersecurity, and that has also changed over time. And so one of the things that's helpful with being a, a gray beard, if you will, <laughs> even though I don't have a beard, is really having that perspective of change over time. It doesn't happen fast, and I think that's really frustrating. And I'll also just say, Guys, we all still see the risks. And so there's a reality that even as we are managing risk, risk is evolving and changing. And so I think it can look hard like nothing has happened, but change has happened. It's just we're managing new and changing risk over time. Brent, I think you wanted to uh, come in as well. Yeah, I was just going to empathize with the uh, questioner. Thank you for it, because uh, here in New Zealand, we're, we're in the same experience as Canada. Uh, we have the FAIR digital um, media bill, which is about bringing bargaining power to citizens. And we are watching the platform's response in Canada and thinking, what does that mean for New Zealand? And it is interesting because previously it was a voluntary landscape where lots of the platforms had negotiated with the um, media, local media, to actually have an exchange of money in order to support the local media industry. And you know that we're still working out. Well, what was the gap there? Um, because it seemed to be working well, and then the reg regulations now stepped in, and it still is just a bill. Um, and yes, these platforms are then saying we're, we're going to withdraw and we're going to stop the, the news. And so we're concerned about that from a civil society perspective, but we're also thinking, well, it's really important to have media plurality um, and that's what we're struggling with. You know, we need to have more media sources um, and have more people media literate. So it's a really great question. And, um, you know, a lot of um, countries' media landscape is changing because of old media and new media. And I think that's what we're all grappling with. So, um, you know, I'm watching the Canadian experience myself personally um, with interest. Thanks, Brent. So um, I want to come back to the questions in the room. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zahid Jamil. I'm an attorney. Um, very quickly, it's, it's, if I look back and say, 
what if in 1996 or thereabouts, somebody decided to say we should have an internet act. My goodness, this is a terrible thing. It could be used for cybercrime and God knows what else. Let's just put, it, put on the brakes and stop it because regulation is very good. Thank God we didn't do that. And the lesser regulation led to very good, you know, I don't even have to explain what, what goodness came out of it. But now we're, we're it's, it's, I find it, it interesting that the example that was just given about how businesses had to respond to a government regulation that led to the businesses being able to do what they wanted to do, right? The, the, the criticism of the business did something, but not, let's not forget it was because of a government mandate. It was because of regulation to, for their liability to be shielded, they did what they did possibly. And so the harm that regulation is causing is something we should also discuss. And I find it ironic that we went around the world from the West and said, you know, Asia and everybody else should understand that we should have self-regulation. It's really good for you. And today on this panel, we have someone from Asia saying self-regulation is good for you from, so from South Korea, whereas we're seeing something else come from Europe. It's, just, it's an interesting dichotomy. I just wanted to sort of underscore it. Thank you for the time. Sorry, uh, I think Rashika uh, also wanted to uh, come in, so we'll go back to her. Just my comment on the previous question. Um, we've noticed that governments around the world are increasingly imposing restrictions on online content and data privacy. Uh, while some regulations may be necessary to protect users from harmful content or cyber threats, they should not infringe upon individuals' rights to free speech or impede innovation. As you believe, because so far we haven't been to that extent, um, best practices should strike a balance between regulation and freedom of advocating for transparency policies that respect users' rights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Farzan um, Badi, uh, uh, I'm in the role of remote moderator. I'm very opinionated, so it's very, <laughs> I have to clarify that <laughs> this is not my question. I'm doing the remote uh, moderation for this session. So we have a question from Rohana Paliaguru. Has any of the online safety acts defined content related matters such as harassment, defamation, et cetera, as criminal offenses? Yeah, I think that that's a, it's a great question that is complicated to answer because there are <laughs> so many different jurisdiction, jurisdictions taking different approaches to that. So I'll open it up uh, to see if anyone from the panel or anyone uh, in the room would want to add some uh, expertise there, but. Um, so let me just uh, pick this up. In generally speaking, it just depends on what the case would be. Uh, like uh, the the bad ones, of course, like uh, the law enforcement can make the case to charge. But on the other hand, uh, some cases the uh, law enforcement couldn't make the case to charge directly. But on the other hand, some the private uh, lawsuit, and then they, they, they got some sanction or mitigation, uh, mitigation, those kind of things. So it totally depends, I would say. Thank you. I was just gonna say, I think that that really exists in terms of areas where in the physical world, there has been an idea of criminality and those laws are able to extend into the digital world. So child safety is an example. I think where you have the offline harm also being exacerbated in the online space where there is existing law is where I would say that currently is. Thanks, Angela. And I think Brent wanted to come and Rashika, so we'll, yeah, uh, Brent and Rashika. Uh, just quickly, uh, in the New Zealand context, yes, um, under the Harmful Digital Communications Act, it's a criminal offence to post an intimate image without a person's consent, and a New Zealander risks either a $50,000 fine or two years imprisonment. Um, so that, that's a type of harm that is criminal and uh, the, the police do prosecute those matters. And uh, Rashika. It's the same for Fiji. Um, we do um, criminalize uh, harassment, cyberbullying, image-based abuse, child exploitation, 
um, and we have, uh, if it's an individual, um, they can have uh, um, five years of imprisonment or $20,000 fine. Um, and if it's a corporate, if it's a organization, then it's 50,000. Um, it, it, it was also mentioned about the defamation. So defamation is not covered under this Online Safety Act, but Fiji does have their own defamation act, which is separate. Great, thank you. Thank Terrific to get the specific answers to that from some of the, the you know, countries that are represented here in our panel. Um, so I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. So uh, back to the room. Yeah, thanks. I'm Chen, um, I'm from ISOC Taipei chapter. And uh, also, uh, um, but today I'm speaking on behalf of a consumer perspective. As a Gen Z, I'm a gamer and a casual minger. So apparently I'm a target audience of this um, like product you're having in this um, like in this alliance. So I have a really um, question like, um, because lots of um, on on online moderation is going on on your um, this products. But I think um, these days, uh, a lot of uh, customers of this product are not very satisfied by this, how this online moderation rules and regulation are enforced. We know, we understand this, um, um, partners from the private sector are very key actor of uh, how to enforce this kind of online moderation stuff. But on the other hand, if you are gonna like keep the transparent of this, how the regulation are going to work and the process to reveal to our customers, it might also hurt your like um, business because um, it might reveal your secret sauce of your business. So I was trying to ask how your alliance trying to find a balance between the transparent and the trust of your customer and how, how to, in, um, like how to mm, make your partner like can get on the board of this stuff. Thanks. So um, I can take a first uh, stab at answering that and then welcome comments from others. It's a great question, it's a very good point. And, and I would say to, to just um, right now within our partnership, we have companies like Microsoft that are you know gaming companies. We have um, companies like Discord and Twitch that are where gamers congregate or are streaming. And I think there's an opportunity to bring more companies from that space in. Uh, and to say, here's what this this framework means with more specifics for gaming. Same thing for for dating, for sharing economy, for different places. Um, the question of sort of how much you share and how much you hold back uh, is a very good one. I think for a long time uh, that this function inside companies has been very quiet and very low profile. Uh, and it's not just because you you don't want to have uh, bad actors be able to say, oh, okay, well, we figured out how to get around that. Um, but also because sometimes the employees working in this, these functions become the subjects of harassment uh, when people do not like what's happened to their content, um, or it's because of privacy considerations or, or other considerations. And um, I think there is a need to sort of shift to be more err on the side of sharing more while being conscious of all of those trade-offs. Um, uh, someone has said that, that trust and safety is trade-offs and sadness. And <laughs> um, one thing I will say also, and then um, we'll have one more question and then close out, is um, for folks who are interested, who are gamers, I would recommend a game that is, I believe it's uh, available in the Apple um, App Store, I don't know if it's on Android yet, called Moderator Mayhem uh, that f uh, f friends and colleagues have made up where you are in the role of doing content moderation inside a company. Uh, it is one of the most stressful uh, <laughs> iPhone games I have ever played, uh, but it, uh, it also gives a sense, you know, it's easy to say, oh, these are gigantic companies and they have the resources and they should be able to solve this. Um, but some of these things are just a perpetual challenge for all of the reasons people have said, and that game is a very good illustration of that. Okay. So I think we can do one more uh, question and then we'll wrap. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Kempling. I run a public policy, public affairs consultancy. Just, well, 
two very short questions. Uh, does the sort of uh, activity of uh, X or Twitter in this space undermine the entire industry and its credentials for sort of voluntary action um, in trust and safety? Um, and then is a non-prescriptive duty of care um, of users a good legislative approach um, towards this? So um, I can answer the first question to just say that uh, not in the business of commenting on particular companies. Uh, however, X, formerly Twitter, was a founding member of our partnership and is not a member of our partnership at the moment. Um, on the second question, I don't have to answer that question because our forum is not a lobbying organization, so we're not taking p positions on legislation. Um, but I imagine uh, that some of our my panelists may have uh, answers on a question that could easily be its own uh, uh, whole uh, session. Um, so maybe uh, if folks want to give last, any concluding thoughts on that or anything else, and then we'll wrap. So we we'll do a rapid fire of, of across the panel uh, here and online. We, I actually, <laughs> briefly, yeah, actually, I, I, you know, missed the uh, chance to talk about, um, talk about the, uh, legislation of in South Korea. Actually, we also have uh, the Punishment Act of Harassment or Sexual, yeah, some something around that. So, Act on Communications Network, yeah, uh, can punish you, the people, uh, criminal act, yes. And, yeah, I, I think uh, this place and this, you know, opportunity can talk about how we are different <laughs> yeah, what we are heading for, <laughs> and I think yeah, the transparency report, y your report, DTSP report, can be concluded, yeah, very well. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, just my final comment is looking forward to to seeing the further development of the you guys worked, and then. And uh, you know, hopefully, the actually, I talked with him about this, but uh, hopefully, that uh, the some Japanese company will join in the partnership, and uh, it's it's kind of awesome in things, but uh, uh, still, anyway, it's a voluntary thing, and then uh, to me, I mean, the from the Japanese government perspective, and uh, of course, in the end, the things get worse, then we have to do things, particularly for the regulation, those kind of things. But uh, from the beginning, I mean, uh, in Japan, we have the like uh, the the basic law about the digitalization and the digital society, and then it says it articles that, that the investment to the digital infrastructure, digital society is private led, should be private led, and the government is more like a coordination those kind of things. We had uh, some list of the, the things that the government should do. So then, uh, so in my mind, as a Japanese government, then then like uh, the bottom line is just let the private go first, and then we follow or we catch sometimes. <laughs> So, so from that perspective, and I, I just want to see the development in the near future, and uh, and then let me end up congratulating the so far the process and the launch of the report last year, right? So, stop here then. Um, before we go over to our online panelists, I'll just say, I think again, this kind of the premise of it's either regulation or transparency is a false dichotomy. I think we really have to think about what behaviors we're seeking to drive, and then you can get to whether that enforcement mechanism should be regulatory or not. But the what that I think is really important that DTSP is contributing here is a way of approaching online safety. And so, we can just argue about regulation or not regulation, but I think the conversation that needs to move forward is less on that side and more on the what we are seeking to drive. Uh, so then, thank you, Angela. Uh, now I think we can go to Brent. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, uh, we used to sit on Twitter's uh, Trust and Safety Council uh, previously under, um, so um, our comments are in relation to who's actually trying to drag the lowest common den denominator up and uh, lead. And um, even though we're not on the Twitter Trust and Safety Council any anymore, uh, X is a founding member of our online safety code and remains in the code. 
um, and whilst they've um, removed themselves from like the European disinformation code, they remain an active member and are providing localized data. So I think, you know, it's easy to call out particular platforms or particular, um, it, you know, times that they're, they're not being a good corporate citizen in the eyes of, of, of particular stakeholders. And I think it's on us to try and drag, you know, everyone in the industry up to the highest common denominator. Um, and so, you know, trying to get them to lead because there's many other platforms and many other messaging apps that are not even part of any sort of move to actually try and show best practice. And I think it's it's on us to actually try and work out where they are and try and bring them along to improve the whole ecosystem. And the duty of care is a really interesting art, uh, argument, which um, I could talk about forever and I'm not gonna talk about it, but I think it's a very really interesting approach to this issue uh, and emerging. So I think it was a good, good thing to talk about. Thank you, Brent. Um, and uh, Rashika, did you have any uh, final uh, th final thoughts? Two sentences. <laughs> um, so uh, Fiji, being a small Pacific Island country, we don't actually have um, a lot of apps being used by our um, citizens here. For example, Twitter. You wouldn't believe that Twitter is not really an issue in Fiji. Like we don't have much issues from Twitter. But we do have issues with Meta and um, Instagram, there's uh, Snapchat, and there's all others. So um, recently, there's, uh, there are a few new apps such as Discord, Line app, um, which we actually did not hear about. And nowadays, we are getting a lot of issues on that platform. So um, we think that we really need to um, build that relationship with the social media platforms to um, learn more about how they um, design their policy community guidelines and everything just to first we should understand before regulating it to the um into our policy we should understand how these platforms work because um we know that these platforms are um dangerous at times but it does um act as a platform as a connectivity to all other people out there so yeah um maybe we can have a balance there if we work hand in hand in a collaborative manner. Thank you. Very well said. So I think that's a great note to end on. We have a sign-up sheet. We have a booth in the village. Uh, come talk to myself or Farzana to learn more about what we're doing. I thank you to all our panelists uh, here and, in, and online. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, hope everyone has a good rest of your uh, IGFs. Thank you. Thank you.